ahead. But then the majority of the time today will be for Q&A. So get going with your questions and we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Uh, so thank you. I'll start by just saying a few words myself. So uh, very far away from the front line of NHS and social care, uh, the bill, the Health and Social Care Bill, Health and Care Bill, has now become an act. This means that very soon CCGs will end, integrated care systems will become statutory bodies and money will begin to flow through them to try and improve health and care and tackle some of the big issues facing the health of the population of England. This is, uh, this is a very major set of reforms, certainly the biggest for at least a decade, even if many of them have grown out of the move towards integration we've seen over recent years. But what's also critical is they're being done at a time of enormous crisis in the health and care system. Workforce shortages, the recovery from COVID, and the struggle to tackle some long-standing issues around inequalities and the need to improve diversity and inclusion. So it's a very, very, very challenging agenda for all those who work in health and care and all those who depend upon it. So without further ado, I shall turn to start to my colleague, Susie. Thanks, Susie. Thanks Richard. Well, yeah, you hit the nail on the head around workforce. Essentially, the pandemic placed excessive um, demands on health and care staff, but it laid bare long-standing issues that were there before the pandemic. Um, it's absolutely certain that we need more staff in health and care. The demand is there, um, but we need to look after them much better. So more needs to be done, more focus placed on, on the workforce and how we care for them. Uh, and that applies to both the NHS and social care. So I think that's one of the highest priorities for the service right now. Great. Thank you, Susie. Can I come to Pritish? Thanks, Richard. So, um, well, it's been really busy in digital. The last couple of years have had a, a lot of publications, some focusing on very specific areas in digital, like the AI strategy or data, others incorporating digital as part of the wider agenda, like the social care reform paper. Um, so really busy, lots going on. One of the things that we're seeing the ramifications coming through right now is the Wade Jerry Review, which uh, made several recommendations around the changes to enable digital to be more successful in the health and social care system. So it recommended the merger of the national bodies and we're seeing that now coming to fruition as the NHS England, X and Digital all come together, which is also causing a little bit of uh, uncertainty in the system. So the good news is the Secretary of State in February announced a, another publication, the Digital Health and Care Plan, which is going to try and pull together a lot of the commitments uh, of the centre, the requirements of the system but also uh, some new tech targets where 90% of um, trusts should be on electronic health records, majority of social care providers on electronic records, and 75%, so three in four people using the NHS app. So massive targets to enable digital transformation in the future. Um, so a lot going on. Whether the budget's there is another question. And it's uh, interesting, I think, to compare um, the challenge of workforce, where we don't have a plan, mm. and digital, where we seem to have something of a surfeit of plans and targets. Uh, can I come to Sally, please? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, so I was going to reflect on public health and social care as two absolutely key partners to the NHS in how to deliver integrated care, but also wider health and well-being. And I th when I think about what's next for both of those, I suppose I think there's reform, there's business as usual, and there's kind of threats as well to them. So for public health, we now have a new set of structures and nationally uh, with the Office of Health um, Improvement and Disparities and the UK Health Security Agency. And that needs to now flow into what does that mean about structures at a regional level and more local levels as well. So a kind of a, an opportunity, but also uncertainty from, from those structural changes. In social care, uh, a bit like with digital, we, we've suddenly got a lot of documents on social care uh, and a reform program which um, probably doesn't have the urgency and the pace that we'd like to see given the scale of challenge and opportunity in the sector, but at least it's starting reform. And so a huge amount to need to be worked through to deliver those reforms over the next 18 months. But all of that reform is happening on top of a massive business as usual agenda. So if I think about colleagues working in public health, they are still working with COVID uh, and they're working with other threats to public health. So only in the last week, monkeypox now kind of with cases appearing in London and the Northeast. So a real kind of challenge to, to public health teams about how can they uh, ensure they embed and apply the best learning from the COVID experience to the, uh, the kind of current set of challenges. 
And in adult social care, as in the NHS, we have a backlog and we have recovery from COVID in adult social care as well. We have people waiting for assessments, waiting for care to be delivered and a huge workforce challenge, a huge and growing workforce challenge uh, in social care with very high vacancy rates. I think it's worth us just reflecting on one threat to uh, the NHS as well as public health and social care, which is the cost of living crisis. Mm. I think we need to think re through that really carefully. So we understand how much poverty can drive ill health. So public health teams will be working with colleagues in local government and in other partnerships with the NHS to really think through how can they do the best to mitigate some of those risks of poverty, including risks that we know will exacerbate inequalities. But also for people drawing on social care, a lot of those will fill the cost of living squeeze at a much greater greater extent than others because they already face a higher cost of living because of their disability. So I think the cost of living crisis will really start to impact on how health and care services are thinking about working with their communities and what the, uh, the kind of short, medium and long term uh, threat to our health is. Thank you, Sally. And I can see on uh, um, one of the <coughs> first polls we've been running about what should be the focus of digital transformation it actually brings together two of our agendas because it's reducing workload pressures. Yeah on staff is where our audience thinks the focus should be and treating new patients is the least popular. I'm not too sure our ministers uh, in the Department of Health would quite put it um, at the bottom of the list. But uh, can I come to Andrew, please? Yeah, and that's a neat segue, actually, because one of the things I've been doing is thinking about this sort of current state of politics and what that means for, uh, for the health and care system. I think the first thing that we've already alluded to or even joked about is about the volume of reform. So there is a lot going on, a lot coming out of DHSC. We've already had an integration white paper, a social care white paper, a health and care app. We've got the messenger review coming, a digital health and care plan, a mental health plan. It's a lot, a lot of stuff. And what we're seeing within that is these sort of two worlds emerging where you've got on the one hand some quite technical detailed policy documents and on the other hand a government that is firmly sticking to quite simple slogans around x number of new nurses x number of new gps x number of new hospitals and the question that leaves me with is given where we are in the electoral cycle expecting an election around 2024 how much of this reform is going to stick and to what extent will the gravitational pull of waiting lists end up dominating all of that so with a government that's set out an elective recovery plan that a lot of the sector thought, oof, those, those targets are pretty ambitious, but just about doable. But a lot of the mainstream said, what? Waiting lists aren't going to get better until when? To what extent will all the reform that we're seeing at the moment actually stick? Or as we get nearer to that election, will it become more and more uh, just about the waiting list? And I think one of the things we can look to very recently is uh, the, the, uh, the pause in some of the public health measures that we saw announced on Friday. So a government that just three weeks ago um, put in legislation the ability to put uh, uh, an advertising ban on unhealthy foods after 9pm, just three weeks later are pausing the introduction of that due to pressure from the backbenchers. So it's, it's an uncertain time politically for what of this quite big reform agenda is actually going to stick. Well, um, we've also got questions um, racing in uh, so that's really great. But I just wanted to uh, kick off um, a bit of a conversation before turning to some of those questions. Um, we've got a set of reforms. We have huge challenges coming from waiting lists, as you say, and possibly more reforms coming through in a different way of working, um, both from digital but also working with partners. Um, leadership styles and cultures. The, uh, the NHS has sometimes have something of a patchy record on inclusive and compassionate leadership. I think this often comes as a surprise to people that work in the private sector to find out that the NHS isn't quite as warm and inviting as it can be. I'd be interested to hear what you think the challenges for leadership and cultures are from the, from the agenda that we're seeing. And I can't, Susie, you know I'm looking at you, I can't help but turning to our Director of Leadership to keep it off. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right, Richard, that, you know, uh, talking about compassionate and inclusive leadership, there are many organisations and systems where actually people would describe their leadership as being compassionate and inclusive, but not nearly enough. Um, I think the, the term compassionate and inclusive has only really been used in the kind of health service and, and, and increasingly in social care over the last sort of five to seven years. So it's only recently sort of come into even sort of policy thinking. Um, you know, fundamentally, it is about how people lead on the ground. It is about those important line management relationships. So you can, you can, you, you know, the, the importance of, of board leadership is obviously critical mm -hmm. and how an organisation is led from the top. But fundamentally, this is about the lived experience of staff day in, day out whether they work in ambulance services, community services and social care. So it's what's the experience of working with your you, with your direct line manager? What, how does it feel to work in your team? That's where culture happens. So you can be working in an organisation that, um, you know, perhaps doesn't have the best culture, but it's still possible to create a great culture 
locally within your team. And I think that's what people need to remember is that we all have influence on the relationships. You know, we have an influence on the relationships we have here at the King's Fund. So even if um, culture and leadership seems like a big topic, actually the way you behave towards your colleagues, um, how you look after each other is really critical yeah. um, in, in, in order for people to be able to care for others. Yeah. They have to be cared for. And, and the leadership question, uh, particularly when it comes up with the NHS, sometimes leads us to trusts. But of course, what we're hoping in the future is that partners across health and care will come together. And Sally, in, in social care, is it the same leadership challenge? Yeah, it, I mean, leadership in social care is, is kind of the same and different. And that absolutely you, you want um, uh, compassionate leadership, whether that's leadership within local government or within providers. But providers are obviously quite different in social care than in the NHS. They're much smaller, much smaller organisations. And that means you can create quite a different culture uh, within a kind of small organisation. Most social care providers are less than 50 people. So that's that's quite different to an NHS trust experience. But I think the key is leading in any point of the system requires really close connection from a whole host of different organisations. So if you're leading in social care as a provider, you need to be able to connect very well to your local authority, to your local primary care provider, to your local trust. You also need to be able to connect really well to your uh, the people you are looking after and their family and their friends and the community because social care is is about much more than uh, being a care home or providing uh, kind of a, a transaction it's about how you support people to live their lives so I think that point of compassionate uh, leadership is really really important if I might I think also one of the things to think about on leadership and what the challenges are or the kind of for me what attention could be over the next phase is also thinking about the leadership style from the centre so from the department yeah. and from NHS England where I think we are going to have a real tension we've got a set of reforms which are intentionally permissive and we've managed to keep that permissiveness all, way, all the way through the parliamentary process for the bill and meant to be giving local leaders much more space to engage locally and to respond to local leads but we then have a whole set of things which will feel like must do. So tackling the backlog, delivering certain digital targets. So how do we assure delivery of some of those national expectations on improvement in a way that still allows that permissiveness and that kind of sense of we recognise and understand things are going to have to look different in different parts of the country. And I think that tension, we haven't yet seen that come to a the kind of right, right equilibrium. Yeah. Um, given the scale of the challenges we've been speaking about uh, that run right across the system. One of the things that the past has often told us and that people ask for is that leaders, national and local, need to prioritise. That has always turned out to be a terrible job to try and get the list down. So I'm going to warn you that I'm going to ask you all, if you could only have one, what would it be? And I'm going to start, Andrew, I'm afraid, with you. If you had, you could carry through one key priority, what would it be? So I think for me, so, so my, my day job here at the King's Fund involves looking after our press and public affairs team who are busy writing press statements, responding to various events. The common theme that we're always saying that seems to be at the heart of a lot of the problems and issues we're seeing is the chronic shortage of staff. And it feels like for a lot of, of the issues, you know, having more staff isn't going to fix things overnight and it's not going to be an overnight uh, uh, job to get the more staff in there. That's for me, would have to be the priority issue across the NHS and social care. And going back to what I was saying earlier with multiple government priorities, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's the one of those priorities where there are targets that the government set itself at the last election. They're written in the manifesto, but it is also the one that doesn't have the comprehensive plan sitting underneath it. We're still waiting um, for, for, for that workforce strategy that we're told is going to be uh, developed by NHS England uh, at some point, the Secretary of State has said. But for me, that would be that that's the one that seems to be at the heart of a lot of this. There's not much you can do if you haven't got the staff to help fix it. I have to shamelessly agree with Andrew on this one. I'm afraid it's my it's workforce, workforce, workforce. Yeah. Fundamentally, we need to have a proper plan, a workforce plan that people understand how many of the variety of people that work across health and care do we need and by when, and a, a, an ability to actually be honest about that plan with local communities. So people are very concerned at the moment about waiting lists, but if we were honest about actually what the trajectories are and actually what how long it will take to get the staff in order to be able to deliver, I think we can have a better conversation with communities then. But you have to do it by having the data yeah. so we need a funded workforce plan for both health and social care i'll give sally and british the chance to disagree if they wish to <laughs> uh well how can you disagree no I, I completely agree workforce even when it comes to digital workforce is absolutely essential um i perhaps maybe my second one would be how do we reconfigure to enable patient experts to 
to overcome some of the bottlenecks in, in our workforce because we can't always rely on the workforce always being there it's always been a challenge digital enables you to change some of the dynamics and bring patients into a different level great so i absolutely do agree but it's a bit boring if we all agree, <laughs> so I agree but here's an alternative so one way to think about what the priority is right now is we have a set of reforms which are meant to be about the NHS becoming something different to what it's been before, a different type of partner engaging with its communities in a different kind of way. So actually, I wonder if one of if the priority is to make sure we give time and attention to ensuring the reforms do deliver the difference. And this isn't just I, ICS has become very large CCGs and still don't understand how to really connect to communities still aren't working with voluntary sector or local government partners in a different way. So I suppose for me, the priority is let's allow what was deliberately going to be different about this to kind of time to embed and flourish. Yeah. But we do need all of the extra staff. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we risk of coming up with uh, a, long a long list, list if, I, if I keep on letting people talk. So let's turn, uh, thanks for that. Let me, let me turn to some of the questions that are coming through and I'll, I'll start by doing the easy thing, which is picking um, uh, the uh, overwhelming leader in the questions. Pritesh, I will be coming to you. Uh, so digital solutions, virtual wards, virtual apps. Um, uh, you've spoken about some of the policy measures that are coming forward, but obviously people are concerned it could lead to a new form of inequality. Mm. Either people with poor broadband, with access difficulties. Uh, how do we deal with these? Fantastic question, Richard. Um, obviously, there's no simple answer, but there are, there are parts of this you know, healthcare system, social care, charities, the local government, all doing really amazing things in trying to overcome some of these traditional barriers. So around data, devices and digital skills are the main kind of barriers or, or that can widen um, exclusion. And so what we've seen that seems to be working is providing people with devices having data banks um, that allow access to data to be able to connect to the system and also then supporting people. So it's not just about the devices, it's having the community of people around you that can help you overcome some of the digital skills gaps that may exist. But I, I also want to add, it's not just about digital exclusion. There's also a, a, an aspect that we tend to overlook, which is how can dig digital do better than traditional care mm -hmm. and how can digital help to overcome some of the time barriers that people might have or um, the travel issues that people might have and so widen access to healthcare in ways that maybe have not been appropriate before. Brilliant. Did any others want to come in about the issue of digital and exclusion? The only thing I think I would add is that we forget that traditional services really struggle to provide good access to significant parts of the population. Mm -hmm. So it's not that exclusion through access is an invention of digital. Yeah. It's a different set of challenges, yeah, um, but it isn't that the old way worked worst. And we've done recent work with uh, people who experience rough sleeping, um, people who are homeless. Uh, uh, and again, you, you can see very, very deep access difficulties mm -hmm. into traditional services uh, mm -hmm. in those areas. I think that's absolutely right. And what will end up happening is there's a different set of exclusion issues with digital delivery than there is with face-to-face -face delivery. And what we need is the health and care system to be trying to minimise and mitigate both types mm -hmm. of, yeah. of exclusion. And both types of delivery are important and are valuable for different types of patients for different needs. So this isn't an either or, it's a how do you blend both together in a way that makes sure communities and population groups aren't being excluded from, from either or both. Yeah, and it's it's having those conversations about inequalities from the outset, building it into the conversation around yeah. digital rather than it being an unintended consequence of, of a di digital innovation. Yeah. Great. So um, coming back to ICSs, we've got a couple of questions around how ICSs will work. And I'll take one of the first ones, which is about um, how far does the Act provide a platform, provide guidance about how the system should try and deal with inequalities? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the answer is it, is it doesn't in that sense. What it does do is place inequalities right at the top of the objectives for health and social care in a way that it's not been before. So I think that is a positive move. Um, there's talk about the triple aim. The triple aim is to provide good quality care, to improve outcomes um, of the population and to do so efficiently, to be good stewards of the public pound. And inequalities now sits very explicitly in those as well. So it's absolutely appropriate for boards of trusts 
for general practices, for all parts of the system to think about inequalities in the same way as they do about other objectives. But the thrust of the act, as Sally has said, is very permissive. It tries to leave the maximum scope to local areas to find their own way. So it doesn't give a blueprint about how it's done. So it does say that it's right to do so, and it's, a, it's an appropriate use of health and care resources, but it doesn't say how. Uh, that does massively increase the onus on local people to work out the answer. But if you think about it, if you're in East London, the challenges you'll face around access will be different than if you're in Norfolk, if you're in Cornwall, if you're in Greater Manchester. And so th there's the hope that that freedom does, in fact, um, mean we'll have more success in dealing with inequalities because it's been a pretty patchy record in the past. That was um, uh, one of the one of the questions. Um, uh, another very popular one is the panel's reflections on how local authorities will be meaningfully included mm. in the work of integrated care systems. So um, they'll hold <coughs> a place on the integrated care board and all local authorities will be on the integrated care partnership. So, so uh, Sally, let me come to you first. Um, uh, a, a worry that local authorities won't either won't really engage or won't be allowed to engage. How do we make sure that doesn't happen? Um, so I think it'd be fair to say, yes, there is a worry because I think uh, the anxiety is we've we've been here before with reforms which are meant to be about the NHS doing things differently and it's ended up feeling quite the same. So there is always that risk that legislation that's quite permissive ends up not being in a, implemented in a way that's really meeting the spirit of the legislation. But actually, I feel unusually optimistic about local government's role in uh, integrated care systems. And those that know me know I'm very rarely optimistic about <laughs> anything. Um, and the reason I'm optimistic is when you speak to leaders in ICSs who really get what the potential of ICSs are, what they talk about is really recognising the skills that local mm. government bring to the table that the NHS just do not have. So particularly about how do local government engage with their communities in a way that the NHS might consult on a reconfiguration, but they do not have a track record of genuine engagement and really thinking about um, how you can work with communities to deliver services. They also in local government have, unfortunately, experience of having to be very innovative in the face of very, very severe funding cuts. So I think they've got a real kind of strength to bring to that discussion about how do you really drive efficiency? And finally, they partner with a huge range of partners, again, that the NHS would absolutely love to be able to tap into to think about their impact on health. So be that housing partners, local businesses about kind of community generation. Um, all of that, I think, is a real strength. And I, when I speak to the ICS leaders, as I say, who really get it, they are really excited about those skills being brought around the table. And quite often when I speak to local government leaders, I say, walk into the room confident that you're bringing skills into the room. Don't walk into the room thinking, I'm defending myself against an NHS takeover. So I'm, I'm optimistic that the relationship with local government is one of the things that is meant to be different. And I do think there are leaders that are getting that and really trying to make the most of it. And Andrew, uh, on that, we've had an integration white paper um, we've got the bill and the integration paper for people that didn't uh, uh, read it, and I don't blame you if you didn't. Um, uh, the, the number of papers coming out of government mm -hmm. at the moment uh, is slightly daunting. Again, really focused on how do you get local government and the NHS and wider partners like the voluntary sector working together, and that's clearly been a key thrust of the bill. How far do you think this is at risk from what you spoke before about the sheer anxiety about the backlog, a very traditional hmm. waiting list backlog um, that is beginning to focus the minds, I think, for many in the NHS and possibly in the minds of politicians too. So I think like, like a few people have said already, the Act, the, act um, the Act sort of explains what the system looks like down to an ICS level and says, and below that you go figure it, like it's whatever works for you. And there's a logic to that in the way that you've just uh, articulated, Richard, because different areas are facing different challenges. So that makes sense. But as with the, the sort of classic issue of localism or centralization is that that means things might be a little bit patchy and it might be different in different areas. So there's a lot for, um, you know, in many ways, that's a good thing. So people didn't want a top down reorganization that says exactly how it should be done in every single area. But it does mean that a lot rests on the relationships and the dynamics and the, the, the will, I suppose, as well, of, <coughs> of each area locally. And I think another thing, going back to something that was said earlier, that'll be interesting to see how it pans out is, um, can those uh, can national leaders at the centre 
um, stop themselves from going in and trying to direct some of what goes on locally. So when it does come to things like waiting lists, where you do have a Secretary of State that has now greater power over the NHS, thanks to the Act, um, are they going to be able to stop themselves from uh, directing those local areas that are meant to be uh, permissive, uh, where they're meant to be able to come up with their own solutions for what works for their community? So time will tell, but it'll involve some restraint on their part, I think. Richard, perhaps I could also add just on the national, I think it's also important that we see national organisations collaborating and integrating in the way that, that they do work. Otherwise, if everything just goes down through NHS England just to NHS organisations, that those national organisations will not be living the spirit of the Act. Well, um, uh, we, we focus particularly on uh, the relationship between the NHS and local government. Um, but of course, the, the hope of ICS is, and indeed the corporation at other levels, that it includes more than just the NHS and local government, but particularly the voluntary sector. Uh, but also, uh, as we know, a lot of the things that really drive inequalities uh, arise from things that go on in wider society. Sally, you've mentioned the cost of living crisis, which is going to push a lot of people um, into poverty. Uh, uh, housing is also well known as one of the key drivers of health it's one of the clearest links so we try and need to get this partnership to work um on a larger on a larger footprint and with a bigger community than than just parts of different parts of the public sector coming together and and so susie I'm going to come to you again how, how do we try and ensure that ICSs genuinely do integrate with not only with their partners in local government but with housing associations sometimes with the with the legal system uh, law and order because uh, that's a real leadership challenge because you're, you're dealing with people in such different cultures not not least between local government and the nhs yeah. but with the voluntary sector and now with these other bodies with very different objectives yeah. or core objectives yeah. even if health usually sits as one of them i mean as you've just outlined richard a huge number of stakeholders in those local local communities with which the ics leadership need to engage and that's quite a tall order um, some of those relationships will exist already so i think we need to remember we're not starting from a blank blank sheet but where some of those relationships exist they may not be the most positive of relationships either so there is something around the clarity of the the kind of what's the task we're all working on what are we all focused on trying to to do together we can do better together um recognizing the contribution of each of those different parts of the of the local place the local community it's definitely important i think that as the ice as the integrated care systems come together that their organizational development in terms of the way they work with partners is very much from the outset seen as a, as a collaboration, that actually they're inviting the views and perspectives of those multiple partners and that they don't go off in isolation and work out how they're going to do it and then try and engage. It's from the outset to be as open as possible. And that's quite countercultural and, and, and maybe quite different, difficult for some of the statutory organisations to work in that way. I don't underestimate uh, the task of the integrated care boards. I think they have a huge dilemma because they've got to run and deliver services now as well as change the way they work. Um, but I think if they can be much more in listening mode than um, speaking mode, uh, if they can spend proper time out in the communities and see the value of what the voluntary community sector is doing, what those other partners are doing, I think there's there's a real chance. And like Sally, I think I'm optimistic about the possibility of of collaboration really being um, really bringing the right outcomes. Yeah, Andrew, I think. And I think the, the, the other thing, so uh, King's Fund are doing some work, uh, a project called Healthy Communities Together, where we're working with different sites around uh, around England, trying to uh, help and support local authority, voluntary sector, NHS to work better together. And we've got a, a sort of learning report coming out from that in the next couple of weeks. But one of the main things that I'm hearing from the team working on that is that you don't just set up the partnership and then it's done. It takes constant work, constant effort. Partnering is an ongoing process, not just about structures. And I think when thinking about the voluntary sector in particular, you know, with the NHS and local authorities, there's an architecture, there a structure, whereas for some of the voluntary and community and social enterprise organisations that are doing really valuable stuff to do with health at the local level, they're, they're small outfits, don't have that same infrastructure around them. And so that needs different ways of working to build and maintain that trust going forward. So it's not a sort of one-off how do we set up the board no. it's that ongoing partnership work yeah absolutely it's relationships need working out all the time they're, they're never they're never static so uh, you're absolutely right um andrew that has to be paid attention to um and also the nhs and social care and some of the statutory organizations need to be open to the way that other organizations do things and actually the learning works both ways yeah yeah and so a, a journey i think and we've seen some of the work the fund has done that it's not something that happens 
instantly. This is not the thing of quick results. It's something that needs investment and persistence over time to, to deliver and get to work as people develop those relationships. I'm going to take a slightly um, uh, more difficult question um, quite deliberately. We, we, the panel won't know, but there's also a poll on how far our CSEs might make a difference. Um, uh, uh, I think the biggest group were don't know, um, mm -hmm. but followed by yes and then the no's. That may seem like a, um, a very uh, modest response, but I think if you'd asked that after 2012, it would have been cripplingly no, uh, a few don't sure, and not many yeses. So as far as large-scale reform of the NHS goes, I think it's um, uh, uh, judging by the difficulties of the past. But we've spoken a lot about permissiveness. Um, um, we know from the past local government faced very deep cuts and had to find their way through many of those deep cuts. And I think... One of the questions that's come through is that is local determination and deliberation, is it a smokescreen for just passing very difficult problems down to local level, given that despite all the optimism about innovation, it would be a very optimistic person that think that every part of the country can innovate their way out of crisis. So uh, the, I don't say that's the cynical view, but let's face it, that's also quite a practical view yeah. of what's happened to some parts of the service over the last um, uh, years. Uh, Sally, let me let me start with you. How, what would your response be? Um, thanks for sending the difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so, what would my response be? Um, I think. It's an absolutely great question, and it is clearly a risk that this is about um, a kind of a government trying to say uh, we gave the NHS what it said it wanted. It said it wanted these reforms. We've given it its money, uh, and it's not been able to deliver. So there, there is definitely a view which could say this is about trying to shift blame. Um, the alternative is to say this is an opportunity to think differently about resources in the broadest sense. So not just about money, but also about people working across health and care as well to think differently and it's actually right that we think about how you deliver and structure a service in Dorset that will be different than, than Newcastle and you will get better value and better outcomes as a result of that so I think I think for me this comes down to we've talked a lot about permissiveness I think alongside permissiveness is courage of local leaders so it's courage of local leaders to think differently so to be talking to people in a different way to how the health and care system has historically done that to harness the skills right across all of the partners to be able to tackle long-standing problems in quite a different way and some of it is also about courage to push back against national mm. leaders so actually if we start to see nhs england directing too much that isn't what the point of the reforms were so we should be seeing ICS leaders and place-based leaders challenging that and saying, no, this is we were meant to be given this space. So I think courage to do things differently and courage to protect the integrity of the reforms is important. But I will say the question is absolutely the right question to ask, yeah. and there is absolutely a risk. Um, and as ever with reforms, there will be a, a normal distribution of the maturity of systems to be able to make the most of the reforms. And there'll be some that are really up for we want to have a conversation about different use of resources, shifting resources to prevention, etc. Others will really be struggling with the kind of day to day job and won't be able to be in that space yet. They could get there over time, but they won't get there yet. I think um, reflecting back uh, in the past, we started a conversation here about prioritisation. Um, and I do think it is a failure of leadership at national level not to try and make some of the difficult decisions if the funding envelope genuinely is yeah. too small. Yeah. I think there's a real risk for the NHS, and I think it's something we've seen in recent years, of national leaders over committing um, the NHS. So providing a funding envelope or a workforce envelope that cannot possibly deliver the things that have been promised. Mm -hmm. And then the health service then gets a bad reputation either for being inefficient or failing to deliver, but it could never possibly have delivered in the first place. What we'd hope is that some of that recognition comes at national level. Yeah. But as you say, there's the possibility, as has happened with local government, that that is pushed back to local leaders. And there's something here really about being honest about what can yeah. be done within yeah. the resources that you've got, which is partly money, 
but it's also staff and it's also the amount of time you need to get some of those relationships up and running and a very difficult conversation to have in what as andrew has said is, is something of a febrile political uh, context but i don't think uh, it, the, the the alternative which is pretending you can do it and failing um, I think leaves everybody in a worse place. Can I just pick up one of the issues that Sally raised, which is how can the courage of leaders to be able to speak out? And I'm wondering what the forums are. How how do leaders speak out? It's not traditionally been possible to speak out. And obviously we have membership organisations like the Confederation and NHS providers who obviously do, do give voice to those leadership voices. But um, it would be great that the national organisations find a better way to really engage with local leaders on what some of those tensions are and that they can work on those collectively. Um, you know, I think there are, some, there are some better relationships now at a regional level and I think we need to see more of that. So how national and local leaders work in partnership um, is going to be really important here because, you know, the leadership task has not gotten easier with oh, this indeed. act. Indeed. So innovation, we've touched on a bit. It's one of the great hopes that, um, uh, and quite rightly, that uh, we can partly innovate our way out of problems. And that's been a mantra throughout most of my career in healthcare. Um, uh, but certainly going through the COVID period, there were innovations that were picked up at enormous speed. I think took everybody slightly by surprise in a, in a, in a very positive way, whether it, was, whether it was including other parts of the workforce, pharmacy in the vaccination programme, but of course, the uptake of digital. Yeah. So, Pritesh, one of the questions has come up about uh, innovation and evidence, and I, I think about this in the um, uh, digital sphere, but there's, there's an anxiety that not all stakeholders around the table as the innovation is discussed, and that you get, in some ways, the wrong answer because the data that's collected, traditionally, from an NHS perspective, would be about NHS costs and NHS activity, <laughs> and it wouldn't look beyond into social care or into other uh, uh, other impacts. Is there an ability through the kind of functionality we get in digital to make data collection easier, or we're we just going to be overwhelmed with too much data that's too difficult to interpret? That's a good question. Um, so yes, there there is potential for the data to improve the decisions that are being made and the innovations that come in. Um, it's about linking the data sets and improving the quality of the data sets, but it's also down to the workforce as well. So having the right skills in place, the right um, analysts. Mm -hmm. So analyst workforce is, is significantly under-resourced. Uh, sometimes they are, if you want to have a better phrase, consigned to the basement, as, as you might see traditionally in, in uh, IT. Um, and so we'll, it's partly recognising that that workforce is very important, needing to grow that workforce in a very competitive environment where we're competing not just uh, amongst providers, but also in other sectors as well. Uh, so it's, it's around the analyst workforce, providing this, the staff on the front line with data, but also the skills to be able to utilise that data to make informed choices on the ground. I'd certainly um, echo what uh, Pratesh has said. And um, when I was leading uh, quality improvement in a large teaching hospital, we had one band AA as the oh, analyst absolutely. for the whole of a you know one of the, a major teaching hospital. So analytical capability is really important, but also helping the workforce understand data better. So it it needs to be part of leadership training as well. I didn't learn until quite late in my career how to look at data properly. So there there is something about how we skill up the whole workforce to to better use the data that we have. So we can really see that things are an improvement. And that's a virtual cycle. So you start using the quality improvement methodologies and you improve the data as well. So it pays off as you continue to do it. And um, I was an analyst in the Department of Health for, for a very long time. And I do remember sometimes being brought in the room to, just to add up some numbers. And I kind of thought, <laughs> I, I, my trusty pocket calculator, I show my age, uh, would be brought out. But I can't help thinking that it was probably not the best use of my skills. I did do other things as well. I didn't just um, uh, add up numbers. Um, Might just be worth adding on data. One of the aspects of the Act, which didn't get a lot of discussion, is um, that there's new powers for social care to be required to provide more information, particularly social care providers. And I think that's really positive that it then forms part of a wider adult social care kind of data strategy where we have known we've been really data poor 
uh, in social care for a long time. And that really restricts the ability to make the case nationally mm. for investment, but also kind of how do you make the case locally for a shift of resource if you can't kind of prove the benefit of it and prove um, what you can achieve from it. So I think it's really positive that there is now a kind of clear sense that we want to get more data in social care available nationally, but also available to partners at a local level as well. It will not happen overnight. This is a long term strategy, uh, which is going to take quite a lot of persistence to get it right. But to me, a fundamental building block, because if you don't have the data, we're not going to be able to keep making the case for reform and investment in social care, be that nationally, be it locally. Well, let me come back to social care. There's uh, still, a, I think, a lot, a, a lot of anxiety about um, both ICSs and, and probably the tradition within the NHS that adult social care is just going to get left out of the loop. It doesn't have the uh, salience in the public mind that perhaps parts of the NHS do and that ICS is still, you can see the um, N NHS footprint of where they've come from. Um, so I'm going to start with Andrew before coming back to Sally. Andrew, do you think <coughs> adult social care, um, I've said doesn't have the salience in the political and mm -hmm. public mind, but I think some people might push back and say, surely there's been more conversation about social care in the last two years than there's been in the last 20. Is it is it still a, a real realistic concern? So, so, so in a way, I, I kind of feel like both things are true. I, I said at the start of the event about these sort of two worlds of sort of technical detail but then political slogans and when you look at social care you know looking back to the Conservative Party manifesto back in 2019 before the election um, it wasn't about wholesale reform it was about making sure that people don't have to sell their home to fund their care and we hear this or heard many times this line about fixing social care but there isn't that that's as far as it as it goes in terms of political rhetoric so I think I would agree that there's been a lot more talk about social care, at least that's my sense anyway. And I think during the pandemic, when we really saw that sector uh, in, in a in a terrible way, very exposed with some horrific consequences, that led to greater debate around it. I think that politically, it's whether it can what's happened so far can be sold as social care is fixed. So I think there's something about keeping the pressure on to say that fixing social care isn't just about the the uh, funding reform, there's a lot more to it, not least workforce as per everything else, access, quality of care, data sharing, as Sally just spoke about. So I think there is a lot more political conversation about it, but how deep that conversation goes, uh, I'd question. Yeah. And and Sally, you, as the great social care uh, guru for many, many years, is your job over? Is it <laughs> kind of done? You need to find something else to talk about. Uh, it would be nice if that was the case, but no, definitely not. Um, so Andrew's absolutely right. A lot of the debate over the last couple of years has been uh, about one particular aspect, so how to share the cost between the individual and the state. Um, but there's a whole host of other aspects of social care reform that's uh, really needed. And um, my colleague Simon Botter actually published a blog just last week looking at the key problems in social care and kind of assessing the government uh, proposals against those. Um, too long didn't read, although it is only four minutes. Uh, there's only one green in our assessment of what government's doing against those eight problems. There's quite a lot of red and amber. So there is a plan, but it's quite small in scale when it's be looking beyond that question about how we pay for uh, how we pay for care. I do think that when we then think about uh, social care's role within the NHS and ICS is uh, and it it might be really frustrating this is the only reason the NHS recognise social care but the NHS is now getting that the lack of home care in huge parts of the country the fact that you can't get home care packages is having a huge implication on the overall system so I absolutely get that it's frustrating that quite often social care is only thought of either as it, that you shouldn't have to pay your sell your house to pay for care or it's a kind of NHS pressure bit but I think the trick for social care leaders and local government leaders is how to sort of leverage that interest. So yes, the NHS is interested because it's having an impact on their capacity, how to then continue to have the conversation in a different way that shows the wider value and benefit of social care, which is about considerably more than how do you keep people out of hospital or get them out uh, quickly. Social care at its best can be completely transformative to people's mm -hmm. lives, absolutely transformative. It can create amazing job opportunities for people, can help people work, connect to it. So it can be absolutely amazing, but too often it's only seen through one of two lenses, which I think that means the public don't quite understand what social care is. Mm -hmm. It's also, it's quite a private thing. It's very diverse, it's very different. So I think people have a much clearer idea of what the NHS is. It's GPs, it's I go to a hospital for an operation, I go get my eyes tested. Social care can feel a bit of a harder thing to sort of 
put your finger on to go, that's what social care is. Great. And um, I do reflect in the uh, Act that more powers were taken to be able to collect data in social care. One of the challenges um, that exists across social care, but also I think in general practice too, <coughs> is sheer availability of data in the secondary care and the fact that we can recall waiting lists with great detail and there's a super mm. Thursday uh, every month as all the data gets mm. released. But these other areas that are equally important just don't have that immediacy of data. And I think some of the changes in the Act um, that will extend government powers to collect data in social care may help there yeah. um, as and well. As an example, waiting times for social care assessment and service delivery. The only reason we know that is the Associative Directors of Adult Social Services do occasional surveys on that. Now, if you that, compare that to yeah, the, the monster of machine, which is routine mm. data collection in the acute sector, it's it's so uh, so different, and that just means it's we're really at a disadvantage in being able to describe what's happening. Yeah, and and I suppose with that, there's uh, going back to the sort of politics of it. We've got the health and care levy that that all of us are now uh, paying through national extra national insurance contributions. The idea of that was that initially money being funneled to the NHS to bring down the elective care backlog, and then more of it will be moving over to social care. When you then look at the targets that the government have set itself for reducing the uh, elective care backlog, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Mm. So what's the political pressure going to be at that point where that money was meant to be shifting over to social care, a sector where you can't as easily see the very real and problems that are happening? So there's a big political question there coming down the tracks. Yeah. And um, let me come back to workforce because, the, 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 uh, again, many questions coming around the workforce and... I think one of the most popular ones is such a key issue um, that we don't seem to be able to address retention of staff and focus continually on just getting more people in that then leave so quickly. I mean, Susie, yeah. why aren't we doing more to try and keep people um, in the workplace and, and why do they leave? Do we know? Um, I think we know some of the reasons people leave, um, but I'm, I'm not sure we spend enough time really, really understanding that fully. Um, in terms of kind of why why people leave, um, you know, one of the things we really need to make sure is both health and social care is a more flexible, uh, supportive employer, so that actually people can can work the hours and work work the way that they want to. Um, traditionally, the NHS has not been particularly flexible, so there's a lot we've learned, I think, um, in the last couple of years during the pandemic about how do you give people flexibility whilst the service is under pressure. Um, I was talking earlier about the importance of that kind of local team culture, you know, the environment in which you come into every day, you know, how it feels to work in your team, how it feels to work in your organisation, even, even in, if you're under a lot of pressure in terms of delivery of, of care, if you're working in a team that's supportive, where you've got a good line manager and actually you are able to work the hours and you've got people that actually care about you, you are able to kind of manage that workload it's not it's not ideal because in, inevitably we need more staff in health and care but it does really come down to your experience of, of working in the organization so better culture kind of good leadership um, a, a, a leader who actually listens to their staff and involves their staff in decision making those are really fundamental kind of basics meeting people's core needs at work that i think we, we, we could really really pay more attention to um, and then I think over time, you know, we were talking about the, the possibility of, of people working both across health and social care. I think there's more we can do to kind of integrate the workforce, how we give people opportunity development. Um, and we haven't touched on um, inequalities in term and discrimination in, in mm. the NHS and social sure. care. And we still have, a, you know, a major problem. The staff survey in 21, which has just recently been um, published and I would encourage everybody to have a look at their local data, what, what, what that's showing, is that 18% of people are uh, experience bullying or harassment from one of their colleagues. I think, I can't remember the statistic in terms of managers, but again, it was high. Um, so, you know, actually people's experience at work is not where it should be. And that's fundamentally, if we don't fix that, people will leave. Yeah. And uh, Pritesh, it's yeah. not long before um, COVID came that uh, uh, I was reading article at Gawande about why do doctors hate their computers <laughs> says, they, and they hate really them they really 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 hate them yeah. and you could see adverts in uh, the medical press uh, for jobs this is from uh, North America saying no EPR mm. no electronic patient record that was felt sufficiently enough attractive enough alongside mm. pay and responsibility to attract people into the job that they wouldn't have to deal with digital do you think that's changed is the pandemic 
change that kind of narrative so that digital is something that might attract people and make life easier so, rather than frankly being one more thing they don't really want to deal with I, I think it's cutting both ways to be honest i think there's the the uh <clears throat> move towards remote consultations has enabled a, a degree of flexibility that people didn't perhaps have in the past and so uh, i was talking to a gp recently who can have their um young child sleeping in the room next door and they can do some consultations and provide additional capacity into a system, particularly important for under doctored areas where, where there's high demand, and not enough staff and, and you can add in capacity by having virtual consultations. Um, and then you've also got the other aspects of virtual, mon virtual wards and monitoring that, that reduce pressure in the healthcare system. But it does cut, as, as Atul very rightly says, the other way as well. Um, where technology is seen as a burden and is seen as going back to the data to collect the data someone needs to be in front of the computer that person tends to be the clinician and so more of a clinician's time is spent in front of that computer capturing the data whereas in fact they probably want to be spending more time with their with their uh, patients so it does cut both ways one of the th one of the things that i feel is perhaps under focused on is how do we enable the technology to reduce the pressures on staff so we talk, uh, you know, there's been a lot in, in the press and a lot around uh, funding as well, around AI labs, for example. Highly contentious area, very difficult to do for clinical uh, service delivery, but on the back end, for reducing admin burden, real, real gains to be achieved there. I think, Pritish, I was reading the article you did for the HSJ earlier this month where I thought the bit that was really interesting was your focus on saying we need to get the basics right as well. So. When we're thinking about innovation and tech and digital, it isn't all about we're being magpies chasing the shiny thing. It's got to be about how some of the basic stuff works. So quite often the staff frustration is it took me 30 minutes to log in this morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's that kind of stuff, which tends to not be the headline grabbing stuff, tends to not be the stuff that a Secretary mm -hmm. of State is all that interested in. But if you only focus on the shiny and don't focus on basics, you're going to constantly be creating different forms of system failure, which are going to be frustrating for staff uh, and potentially for patients, depending on what that failure is. So that need to kind of look across the whole spectrum of how do you ensure you've got a health and care system that can make the most of digital uh, is really important. Yeah. I just wanted to pick up on something Susie said as well, which is to really emphasise that flexible working point around retention. So. Uh, in the news this morning, there were uh, 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 nationwide figures around unemployment and how record low it is and changing workforce behaviours and people wanting that greater flexibility. I think we could probably do with some political leadership to provide the air cover for that because it's not uncommon to see reported around staff who work less than full time and that being seen as a real negative mm -hmm. and that being seen as laziness. Well, I talk to friends who are general practitioners and each day is a 12 hour day. So they choose to be employed for three because that's enough for them with their other commitments. We see from surveys that uh, the King's Fund has done in the past of uh, general practice trainees coming through the system. They don't want to do full-time clinical. That's because they want to spend some of the other time doing research and other things related to their job. So that, that flexibility, rather than seeing that as a, as a negative, that's a positive to attracting people into the profession because otherwise we're looking at burnout if you're doing 12-hour days, five days a week for all of your career. Yeah. And I just uh, wanted to quickly, because we are beginning to come to the end of our time, to pick up again one of the questions uh, about Pritesh on, on the data side and people that have not traditionally been around the table. And it, it links to another question about the opportunities for co-production with communities here. And I think um, uh, we slightly interpreted the question as how do you collect more data about people that have previously not been around the table. But I think one of the things we saw from COVID was if you really want to reach people that have not been reached before, you need to do something different. Trying to do the same thing with the same people isn't going to work and hasn't worked in the past. And that's where that co-production strength, I think we saw um, in real life in COVID about how you try to reach people to raise some of the vaccination rates and um, make accessibility to the vaccine easier so again I, although probably not going to put this one to the panel that issue about working with those communities again sits in here is a, is a it's a challenge for leaders to do it um it's an area where the voluntary sector may again be able to help it's an area in some cases that local government mm -hmm. could help too but in so many of the cases um the, the nhs phrase of non-compliance or won't well, patients please do what i've told them to do um <laughs> it, it's not the dialogue to have and it yeah. hasn't worked so there needs to be a different way of doing it as we're coming up to the last few minutes, um, I'm going to ask the panel about their optimism 
um, for uh, for the future. That's also been a poll to see um, uh, what you think about um, the next couple of years. But I didn't want to lose um, just one other thought. We we haven't answered many questions about general practice. There have been some here, but they've not floated quite so much to the top. But one that did come up was about money for general practice to help them work with the community, to help them work with secondary care. Um, I do think this is an incredibly important point. We remember that trusts are great big organisations with mm. tens of thousands of employees and um, uh, directors, boards, forgetting that often like social care, um, general practices are often quite small. Um, they don't have the depth of resource. And so that, although there may be great examples of best practice, there may be great examples of innovation they can do, it's not easy for them to develop the improvement backbone mm. that you can see in other parts of the service. And often national bodies have been reluctant to provide it on the grounds that they're not NHS bodies, they're private organisations. I think one of the things we do need to think about um, for the future is how do you help um, uh, general practice? How do you help social care providers? How do you help sometimes the voluntary sector um, to make the changes? Just having a good idea isn't enough. You need to know how to do it. It's about uh, implementation. So I think whether it's money or whether it's staff, um, we did used to be able to do this, by the way, rather better in general practice in the days of PCTs. There were improvement teams. So it's not something that we, we can't do, um, uh, but we need to come back to that again. So that's on general practice. So very, very quickly, um, on a scale to one to five, one is very pessimistic, five is optimistic. And I'm not going to tell you what the poll says. Um, uh, I'm just going to I'm going to tell you at the end. So uh, one to five, one being bad, five being uh, very good. Sally, where are you on the scale? Um, I'm two, bordering on one. Do you want reasons? Uh, no, okay. thank you. Because um, then you'll all have to give reasons and we're too close <laughs> to the time. Pritesh? Uh, similar, I'm on two. Uh, I hope you can't see the screen. Um, uh, Susie? I'm three, going down to two. I'm glad to hear the leadership side contains <laughs> a greater I'm degree of optimism. More optimism because there's some amazingly talented people throughout the service and, and I do have confidence that they'll do everything within their power to make the changes. And uh, Andrew? I'm, uh, I'm landing on a three and because I'm last I'm going to explain briefly why, which is because although the British Social Attitude Survey that we in the Nuffield Trust analysed did show that satisfaction with the NHS at a 25 year low, it's quite pessimistic, it did also show that the support for the model and the principles of the NHS is absolutely there. Uh, and I think there's the, the will is out there in the system. There are pockets of good. Uh, and that's what makes me feel a little bit more optimistic. And as I'm um, acting as chair, I can cheat completely <laughs> by saying I'd give it a, a low two for the next year or two, but a pretty solid four. Partly for what you say, Andrew, that the faith in the founding principles are as strong as they ever were. Uh, and I think we often know, we know where the problems are around workforce. The NHS has sorted waiting times before. Don't forget that mm. um, we have been here before and the NHS got out of it. And I think the opportunities from working with the voluntary sector with local government hold out a more optimistic future. So I cheated by giving um, two answers. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and uh, our audience, 44% um, uh, at two and 32% at three. So um, there are two bordering on a three um, and then uh, one is the very pessimistic, but it's actually quite some way behind. So those two between them take uh, nearly 80 percent of the vote. So uh, let me let me draw this to a close. Thank you both to all the panel and to all of you for joining us and all the questions I've been seeing coming through. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. I tried to pick a mix of both the most popular um, and some of the ones that picked out um, some challenging challenging issues. We'd love to hear what you thought of today's event, so don't forget to fill in the feedback survey by clicking on the feedback icon on the left-hand taskbar. And uh, if you missed anything or would like to share with colleagues, the event will be available to watch on demand until the 14th of June. And we hope to see you at another King's Fund event in the near future. Thank you very much and goodbye.